From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman and welcome to this CUBE conversation. Going to be digging in, talking about how storage in the software world is moving forward to cloud native, containerized environments. Happy to welcome to the program, first time guest, Paul Sussman. He is the product manager for InfoScale storage and availability products with Veritas. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me on. I'm really excited to talk about what we're doing for support for containers and Kubernetes. All right, so you know Veritas. I think you know most people should be familiar with Veritas when it comes to the storage world. Of course, you know a strong and long history. Uh, why don't you level set us first uh, on, on InfoScale? Uh, you know, I, I've got way too much history going back to you know things like Veritas Volume Manager uh, and, and 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 the like. But uh, you know, InfoScale today in 2020, how should we be thinking of it and kind of the reach it has out in the marketplace? Yeah, first off, our InfoScale. InfoScale is a product that's used by very critical uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, the top enterprise is the top uh, 11 out of 12 airline reservation systems, the top 19 out of 20 investment banks. Right? These are companies that use InfoScale to drive their, their business, not just an application, but actually keep their business um, available uh, and operational. So we've had a long legacy. Uh, we talked about some of the history. We are formerly known as Storage Foundation. Going back 25 years, uh, Veritas Storage Foundation, as it was known at that time, was one of the first virtualization technologies where we virtualized storage for hard drives, right? That's where the volume manager came in. We really support for uh, many different file systems, uh, both clustered or shared storage, as well as non-shared storage. Uh, came out with support for Unix to Linux migrations, added support for virtualization, technologies and came out with a lot of optimizations for storage efficiency and performance optimizations. Well, and it's, it, we've been building upon that legacy ever since. We've recently come out with a lot of uh, support for uh, AWS Cloud as well as Azure Cloud and support for SAP HANA as well as SAP NetWeaver for uh, Azure. And uh, we have customers who are now migrating to their SAP environments up into the cloud. So uh, long history of this, uh, we came out with Docker support back in 2016 for Docker containers. We made a bet that Docker was going to win. We actually built our net backup flex appliances around the Docker platform. Uh, it turns out that that bet wasn't quite accurate. It turns out Kubernetes won. Uh, there's some standards now that have come out around storage and networking interfaces. And the world has shifted and is picking up that, that standardized platform. Uh, so we're doing the same. So what we're doing, uh, a couple different things. First off, we are uh, coming out with a persistent storage solution for uh, leveraging the CSI storage interface. And uh, we're coming out with a high availability solution, which is le leveraging some of our legacy code around VCS and around the service group technology we have and intelligent monitoring framework to monitor what's going on inside the container. And we're going to be adding that uh, technology into InfoScale and releasing it uh, later this year. So that's what we're actively working on. I'm really excited about the fact that we're able to bring forward this legacy that we have, where we've done incredibly well on physical environments and virtual environments, and as customers move to the cloud, to also support containers. Um, we're seeing that mission critical applications are starting to move to containers. We're having a large uh, number of our customers come to us and saying, you know, what's your roadmap? Where are you going on containers? We've been talking about the Flex appliance on the Net Backup appliance where we've done uh, release support for that years ago. And uh, they're looking to actively start moving some of those mission critical apps. But what they're seeing is, is that in the container environment, it's missing a lot of the enterprise capabilities that exists on physical hey, platforms. Paul? Yeah. Paul, if, if I could. So, you know, I'm glad we got the news in here. I want to help if we can level set our customers a little bit on, sure. you know, the, the marketplace here. So, you know, I, I think back to, you know, server virtualization and VMware. Uh, we spent about a decade as an industry going from, yeah, it's supported and it works with it to how do we really optimize it and make sure it is really supported. When you talk about cloud environments, talk about containerization, you know, we've gone through a maturation journey there also. And in some ways, 
uh, it, it's gone a little bit faster and we've learned from the past, but it, it, it has been a journey we've been on. So you talk about, you know, Docker, you know, Docker helped really, uh, you know, bring containers uh, to, to the masses and the enterprise especially. Mm -hmm. Um, but maybe give us a little bit as to, you know, you threw it a couple of things like, uh, you know, uh, interfaces uh, that, that are supported uh, to enable uh, storage more, how Kubernetes fits into things. Um, help us understand, you know, how it's not just supporting the environments, but making sure that they're optimized and take advantage of the feature functionality that people are looking for uh, and, and why they go to these you know, containerized and, and Kubernetes environments. Yeah, that's a, that's a great thing. So first off, I, IDC called out that containerization is, uh, actually has a potential of replacing what VMware has done around uh, VMs and virtual machines. And uh, that's, I think there's several driving factors for container adoption, right? It comes down to uh, that term, cattle not pets, uh, which is often used around containers where you're able to manage things at larger scale or a larger number uh, of items. And it comes down to the fact that the container itself is a much smaller image size than a VM. It's a fraction of the size of a VM. And that makes it possible to be more agile, makes it possible to, to have a higher density of containers versus VMs. It, it makes it easier to manage as well. And because of that, uh, there's faster adoption uh, with developers and speed and efficiency coming about where developers are, are making changes quicker uh, in a container environment, and that's very appealing to customers. So we're seeing a lot of uh, interest in containers. The applications that went there first were applications that were not the typical mission critical application, but were more of a web type application that has, didn't have a dependency on persistent data. The data was temporal. Um, but what we're seeing now is as adoption happens more and more in the container environment, and as people realize that there's a lot of advantages to this container versus a VM, uh, they're looking to take those applications and lift and shift them to a container environment uh, to take advantage of, of those benefits. And so that, that's what we're seeing right now. Yeah, I, it, it's real interesting, right? You know, Paul, when you looked at that virtualization uh, adoption, it was, what a VM really did is it brought the whole operating system along with me. So inside that we have, you know, not only the operating system, but you know, typically one application, but could be more, as opposed to a container gets closer to that atomic unit of the application, or even if it's microservices architecture, it might just be a service inside there. So I, I guess that that brings us to the, the point, when you talk about storage, what I really care about, I care about my data, I care about my applications, as you mentioned, uh, often there are different, you know, different type of applications. Developers are building new applications using uh, containers. Uh, as an example, help us understand, you know, where where Veritas and Infoscale fits in. What applications you're supporting uh, today from a containerized environment, and are there any things you're seeing as to, you know, hey, this is what you should do in containers, and at least for certain enterprise environments, maybe we're not quite ready for uh, certain things here yet. Yeah, so let, let me take a step back. If you look at the maturity and that technology shift, uh, in my opinion, we're at today with containers where we were early on with VMs. So early on with VMs, a lot of people were saying that those virtual machines, they're not really suitable for production code. They're not suitable for mission critical applications. You really should run those on dedicated hardware. And what we've seen is, a, is actually a shift in VMs and people run pretty much everything on VMs now. It's your first platform um, by default. Uh, instead of a physical server. And now the same thing is kind of happening with cloud as well. Uh, in containers, what we're seeing is that the early adopters, they weren't looking for those mission critical or enterprise data uh, requirements, things like security and scale and performance. Um, they were okay with the status quo, uh, but as people are starting to move things that drive their business or they're gonna run their business on, they're they really need those requirements. They need the, the same level set of enterprise capabilities that exists today in VM, uh, on VMs and exists today on physical environments uh, or even in the cloud. A, a lot of capabilities in the cloud are, are you know, it's very secure, uh, it's very resilient, the data is very durable. Uh, those capabilities exist there, but on containers, they've been lacking uh, until recently. And so what we're doing is we're trying to bring those same capabilities that our customers are used to uh, for those customers as they're moving those mission critical uh, applications to containers. 
Excellent. So let's talk about the, the, the services that, that InfoScale offers. Uh, you know, when we first moved to cloud, there were some that thought, oh, hey, wait, maybe I don't need to think about things yeah. like high availability and data protection. I'll just architect the cloud that way. Um, I, I think we know from like security standpoint, it's a uh, shared responsibility model that everybody understands. Um, when it comes to you know containerization, also I'm often architecting things differently, so I have to think about things a little bit different. But I don't think it removes the need uh, for some of the services that we t typically see uh, from solutions like it, like you offer from Veritas. Maybe, maybe give us a little yeah. bit of understanding as to you know is it the same? Is it a little bit different? And, and what is needed in in today's new architecture? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So. If you look at containers and start reading a lot of the documentation around Kubernetes, what they claim and what they point out is that the underlying storage is responsible for the high availability of the storage. It's not, not the requirement of the application. It's uh, not the requirement of the IT administrator. It's they, they claim, push it back on the storage. And, it, and if you look at the way storage is used or consumed with containers, it's really there's two types of storage. There is block level storage, which is uh, presented from the disk array. The challenge with block level storage by itself is that there's no data management, right? There, th what ends up happening is that the database does the data management and the database uh, in order to uh, uh, le take advantage or, or uh, comp uh, compensate for that lack of data management. Often what happens is the, data the database is oversubscribed. So you, you present too much uh, data for the database and you end up wasting space. The other side of things, uh, the, the common use case is around files. And the most common use case or the most uh, way that most people use with containers is actually leveraging NFS. And NFS was never designed for mission critical applications. Uh, it's really designed for very small IO and it will guarantee or maintain right consistency. But if you have multiple applications accessing the, the same share, who knows who's going to actually win? Somebody will win, and it might not be who you want to win. So you have data uh, corruption or data uh, integrity issues with NFS, not to mention that you have huge performance challenges with NFS. Again, it was never designed for mission-critical application. And so those are areas that our customers have looked to us in the past uh, and look to us right now to uh, present uh, storage, which is very high performance, and very highly available and is often replicated across the metro or across geo locations, across availability zones to other data centers so that you have multiple redundant copies and so that you just don't lose data, right? That's something that we've done really well with InfoScale. And we've done that for applications that require shared resources. And we've done that for applications that require their own repository, their own uh, data store. So uh, it, it's an opportunity for customers uh, to use or have an, um, other storage, which is persistent, highly available, and higher performant uh, for use with their containers, uh, other than NFS or block storage. Excellent. Well, you know, we we know that the you know storage we always used to joke, uh, Paul, is that the only constant is change. Uh, in the cloud native world, uh, we, we know that accelerating change uh, is the norm. Uh, give us a final takeaway. When I think of InfoScale for Kubernetes and containers, how should we think about Veritas and you know, what differentiates you from uh, really the, the rest of the marketplace? Yeah, if you, if you look at that, it's really simple. I mean, we, we, we have a solution which works very well for storage, very high performance, very highly available, scales really well. Uh, we are going to be releasing a plugin for Kubernetes that will install on storage nodes and make that storage uh, persistent and available to the application running up as a container. Uh, we're also taking the technology that we've done around uh, our availability suite, and we are uh, taking some of the technology forward into containers. Now, understanding that Kubernetes does the orchestration, uh, our key differentiation is that we're going to be uh, monitoring the dependencies of what's critical for that application, right? All the mount points, the network interfaces, all the different processes would make, make up that uh, critical uh, application. We'll be monitoring those applications uh, actually inside the container and then working with Kubernetes to, and collaborating as far as orchestration goes. So we'll tell Kubernetes when it needs to uh, restart the container or restart a pod 
Um, lots of advantages come with the solution and the way we're building it. Again, it integrates with Kubernetes. We, we monitor the, what's going on inside the container and we'll notify Kubernetes of an event change. And we'll, we'll do that instantaneously. Um, Kubernetes looks at the pod. They don't look at inside the container, right? They don't look at the processes. They don't look at the mount points. So the pod might be available, but the container itself, you might've lost a process. You might've lost one of the containers. Uh, one of your dependencies might've gone away. And uh, we're taking that same availability offering that we've done very well with in the physical environment, in cloud, in virtual environments, and bringing that forward to containers. Excellent, Paul. Uh, any any minimum requirements? You know, Kubernetes, of course, uh, being open source. There there are dozens of distributions out there. So if I choose, yeah, you know, any of the native services from the public cloud providers or from my vendor of choice, uh, I don't have to be like on 1.16 or 1.17 to get this. Uh, what, what are uh, what are any considerations there? Well, the latest version I think is 1.18. They're coming out with 1.19 soon. Yep. For Kubernetes, but uh, Kubernetes, in my view, they came out with the standards. They came out with a standard network interface and a standard storage interface. We're leveraging those standards and we're building a plugin towards that standard. That same plugin will be used in Kubernetes and OpenShift and VMware, as well as all the different cloud container offerings. So our, our intention is to support all those. We'll be supporting Kubernetes on day one, uh, out of the box uh, for Linux platforms, uh, with all the same storage capabilities that we have with InfoScale and with the same agent framework and monitoring framework that we have with InfoScale for availability as well. Excellent, well, Paul Sussman, thank you so much. It's been great to watch the maturation of the storage environments in the container and Kubernetes world. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, thanks for having me. All right, I'm Stu Miniman and thank you for watching theCUBE.